What's up guys, it's Bromley. Today I'm going to talk about the Reverse Hyper. I'm actually just about to get into a workout right now and I use this and have been using it recently as one of my kind of default warm-ups to get ready for my lower body work while also adding some volume that'll hopefully help my erectors and my midsection get stronger for bracing under heavy deadlifts. So I wanna talk about how I have kind of critiqued it in the past and how I use it now and how my use of it kind of fits into my general worldview of how you take care of your midsection, how you keep your back strong. One of the criticisms I've had in the past is that I thought that it misrepresented what having a strong back means. And I think there's still an element of that that's correct, but I think it's just important that this has to fit in with all of the other things that are important for keeping your midsection strong. So most people just think if your back is weak, your back can't support a load. So you just need these muscles stronger and then you'll be able to support a load and you'll be able to stay upright under heavier squats and maintain position under heavier deadlifts. Now there's a piece of that that's true, but most of what goes into keeping your spine stiff and rigid under a heavy weight has less to do with one piece of you being strong or specifically your back being strong. It has more to do with general coordination. So all of the injuries I've had and any of you that have watched my channel, seen my older videos on bracing uh, while you squat and deadlift, know that all of the issues I've had, and I've had a lot of injuries from my early years, they stemmed from weak abdominals, not just weak abdominals, but inactive abdominals. I didn't have a concept of exactly how to squeeze, so I wouldn't recruit the muscles of my abdominals to create equal and opposite tension all the way around my midsection, and that created a massive weak point. So as strong as my legs and hips got, this was the spongy weak point that would fold under the heavier weights. The result was multiple injuries, um, herniated discs, injuries that have sidelined me for months where I thought I was never gonna lift again. And the road back involved pinpointing that as the main weakness, getting that coordination down, and then learning how to transfer that into all of my other lifts. So to kind of go over, most of you uh, have heard of Stuart McGill or have come across some of his movements in McGill 3. He's done work with Brian Carroll, who he helped rebuild from just devastating back injuries from equipped powerlifting. The basic idea goes like this. The muscles of the midsection are meant to restrict movement in the spine, not to actually facilitate movement. So instead of conditioning through sit-ups, crunches, leg raises, stuff like that, we condition the muscles to activate in an isometric fashion, to limit motion. Then we go through the process of learning how to get the extremities to move, how to get your legs to move while the midsection maintains position. That's the big one. Most of you don't have the coordination to do that. Many of you do, some of you athletes might, but many of you will be surprised that if you try to do something that separates your spinal movement from your hip movement, that you're going to have a hard time separating those movements. So if you ask somebody to bend over and pick something up, you might find that they move at the spine and the hip simultaneously, as opposed to what something like a deadlift is, which is, which is a hinge where the spine and the hips are two separate entities governed by two separate movement patterns. So you have to get coordination. The weakness that we're talking about isn't necessarily the muscles aren't developed, it's that they're not being switched on and if they don't switch on, especially in the right order, they're not going to do their job. So that's where things like the curl up and the side plank and the bird dog and then things like dead bugs come in that condition you to brace and get comfortable with these movements. So once we get coordination down, then we have to go into endurance because there's no point moving a load or, or trying to uh, go through a hard workout if you don't even have the endurance to maintain that position. So you will be amazed if you do things like 90-90 breathing or, uh, or uh, curl ups uh, or any of the, the type of hard isometrics that force you to bear down and hold that position and maintain that tension in your midsection for a prolonged period of time. For many of you, even if you get to that point of recruitment, two or three breaths and it just goes dead and you'll see that that switch turns back off. So you build on your endurance, you get yourself to be able to hold that position, maintain that cue for longer. Then and only then do you go into step three, which is actually trying to increase your ability to produce force that way. So you're talking about either using weights or you're talking about more disadvantaged movements that require more strength from your midsection. That's like going from a plank to an ab wheel, something like that. But you don't put the cart before the horse. You have to make sure you can maintain, maintain position. If you're doing an ab wheel and your back hurts because you're arching, that's a crappy position, right? So you have to maintain position first, then you have to be able to do it for a longer time. Then you have to progress to something like an ab wheel when you know you're doing it correctly. That is how you condition these muscles to work together to build circumferential uh, stability, you know, pulling against each other in equal and opposite manner. 
only then are you going to be able to see that carry over to things like squatting and deadlifting where you have to stay rigid bent over under a load so erector strength and specifically what the reverse hyper does it's relevant but it's only a piece of that puzzle and that's how i see it now you might have heard that guys like mcgill have problems with the uh extension and flexion of the spine under a load right here i'm not sure that the studies that they've done on things like cadaver tissue uh really says a lot about what happens in the real world i know that mcgill is picky about things like crunches and sit-ups as being detrimental to the spine and leading to more bulging discs or whatever he is a spine specialist but then again he's not an athletic specialist so i have to take that with a grain of salt because in the 20 years i've been doing this i have seen no association no reason to believe that people that do more ab work even if it's sit-ups or crunches I have, no, I have no reason to believe that they suffer more herniated discs. If anything, it would seem to be just the opposite because if you do those movements, you likely have a strong midsection and you can likely bear down even at a disadvantaged position. So I'm not sure how I feel about that. So he's picky about the reverse hyper that the flexion and extension is going to make pre-existing issues worse. That may be the case, that may not be the case. I know I have a ton of low back issues and as I've applied this to that specific regimen that I laid out, my bracing and stability, especially under heavy deadlifts, has just gone through the roof. Now, I don't necessarily credit this as a rehabilitative tool, the way that it's sold, and that might be a reason. I'm not saying that this has made my back feel amazing. I'm not saying that that has uh, been the thing that's fixed my back. All of the bracing stuff I talked about before, learning how to recruit my abdominals and apply that to the compound movements, that has been the deal breaker. This is something that allowed me to actually give a little bit more. If you've seen my recent deadlifts, when I was going for max deadlifts, I was trying to get a leverage advantage by getting long, letting my shoulders hang, getting a little more round in the upper back, but still trying to brace right here. And that extra advantage in the setup was huge, but I couldn't do that unless this was all locked in. And it turned out that for me, my rectors actually were a weak link because my back is long relative to my height, the erector stimulation I was getting from things like good mornings and deadlifts represented too much of a systemic stress. So I had a hard enough time getting enough frequency to really get my erectors to grow. Any real hard effort would put me out for a while before I could lift again. This was a way to get extra training volume in specifically on my erectors without blowing my wad, without dealing with the achy low back of, of trying to do a lot of compound movements and a lot of reps that way. Um, and I noticed that as I did this more frequently, and specifically in the way I'm about to show you, that I had a ton more stability and felt better as I would try to bring in my abdominals, my obliques into my brace. As I would come down, this stayed tight. Notice I still have a neutral position in my low back. That's huge. You can't just dump your shoulders forward and hope for the best. You have to know that your midsection is completely neutral. So as I brought my abdominals in and got my brace better, I noticed the extra stability in my erectors from thickening out was huge. And I was able to get a lot more aggressive with heavier pulls. I didn't have to go in worried that my back was going to hold up. I felt strong in that position. So I do credit this to that. So I'm going to do a quick set, show you how I run through this and then getting on with the rest of my workout. So you'll notice here that uh, our strap wore down and I haven't bought another one. So I just connected uh, two red bands to uh, fabric D handles and I just use the D handles as clips and it works well enough. So I'm gonna that. Okay, hopping up. I like to have my hip hanging off a little bit, but not too much or else the pressure puts in my abs makes me wanna black out. That's what it feels like it's gonna happen. So I do have to support myself quite a bit on the table or else the pressure's pretty hard to deal with. From here, legs straight, getting just a little swing, and then flex. And just a little resistance on the way down. Gentle dismount. So I'm not going for anything crazy there. By focusing 
on my low back, on my erectors, I still feel a little bit in the hammies and glutes, but the difference is I'm not looking for a pure hip extension. I actually want that extension at the top in my spine because that's what puts it in my erectors. That's what I'm going for. So by just getting through one set of 15, I already have a lot of blood in my low back. I feel that muscle cramping up the way your bicep cramps up when you do a concentration curl. And I just do a couple sets like that. Now I did notice uh, that I had trouble doing these for a long time because I kept trying to put them at the end of the workout and that did not fly. When my glutes get a little tight, they have a really hard time moving through any range of motion. So the swing on the way down made my glutes feel like they were just gonna rip apart. I mean, it wasn't muscle pain. It was legitimate nerve pain. And that probably coincides with sciatic issues I have, but the nerve pain on the way down when my glutes got a little pumped was unbearable. So I just never did them. What I realized is I could get three or four good sets in before my workout or on off days, and then I can go through the rest of my workout and it's fine. So this is an example of getting a little bit of pre-fatigue before things like deadlifts or strongman events. And I've actually gotten to the point where I actually feel better when I do it at this start, where it's not detrimental. So that one-two punch of getting a little fatigued here and then trying to get it to carry over into my deads while I focus on bracing, I think that has added something to it as well. I'm not swinging for the fences here. Again, this is just a little bit of uh, recruitment, focusing on recruiting that area, getting it to, to kind of wake up. And it's just a little bit of extra weekly volume that helps me create enough stress to get that targeted area to grow. I did this before nationals. Um, I mean, a good example of my deadlift with the right weight, my legs and hips can go for days. I've pulled 605 for 10 dead stop reps and in high, I knocked them out in 30 seconds. In hindsight, I could have done a few more. However, at that point in time, I had only deadlifted 700 pounds, I think on one occasion. So the spread between my rep capacity and my power output, part of it's because I train high reps a lot, but part of it is because I could never go heavier because I didn't trust my midsection. So the first time that I it really went for a big pull, I know for a fact I only got that pull or I wouldn't have otherwise gotten that pull if I didn't have the extra confidence in what my midsection can do. And the little bit of strength I got in my erectors to allow me to handle that position was a big factor. So I definitely think it contributed to the 718 pull that I did at nationals. And as I continue to get my midsection stronger, I'm going to have more confidence for bigger pulls. I'll be able to push rep work higher, volume higher. I'll be able to sustain more total work without that area kind of falling apart because that's always, that's always the ceiling. It's always, you know, my, whatever my legs and hips can handle is up here with deadlifts. It's always, okay, my lower back doesn't like that. Let's take it back down a notch. So all of the bracing I went over, it's been huge to helping me uh, recover from all of the injuries and setbacks I've had, and I've had a few from being a young, dumb teenager. It's helped me re-solidify the strength of my midsection. It's helped me have immense confidence on big pulls. Uh, and it's even helped with the other strongman events where you have to be bent over and you have to be really exposed in a deep rounded position like you, you're in on an atlas stone pick, on a sandbag pick. There's a lot of awkward movements where you have to put a lot of faith in that area in your body. So the extra stability has really helped out with that. So at this point, I think most people have a reverse hyper. This I got from Titan. And honestly, I was super happy with it. I got this three, it was like $330 shipped. That was the discount I got. It was dirt cheap for what it is. Uh, like I said, that came shipped. I put it together uh, and it worked out really well for me. I like it. It's just sturdy enough. I don't need anything that's built more than this. It doesn't take up that much space. I can get, I mean, I don't know how much more weight you need to put on these. This it can hold five plates per side. Uh, it moves pretty well, hasn't given me any issues. So I'm a fan of it. Anyways, if you have any other experiences, any questions or comments, go ahead and leave them in the comment box. There's gonna be a lot more breathing, bracing, kind of prehab, rehab videos on this topic because this is one that is near and dear to my heart and a lot of people sleep on it until something goes wrong. So you gotta remember, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, okay? So again, questions, comments, till next time, this is Bromley, I'll see you.